Hello and welcome to the Find Your Feminine Fire podcast. I am your host, Amanda Testa. I am a sex, love, and relationship coach. And in this podcast, my guests and I talk sex, love, and relationships and everything that lights you up from the inside out. Welcome. If you're looking to learn the real secret to sexual wellness, then turn up the volume as this episode is going to share the truth about magic pills when it comes to our sexual health. I am your host, Amanda Testa, and I'm so thrilled to have my friend Pelvic Floor Powerhouse, Dr. Betsy Greenleaf today. She is the first board certified female urogynecologist in the U.S. and is double board certified in obstetrics and gynecology as well as female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. So she is quite the educated woman when it comes to our pelvic health. Welcome, Betsy. I'm so excited to have you here. And I'd love just to dive in because I know we have so many different avenues we can go. Uh, And I know we talked on Friday and I just love how you say, you know, being that you have such experience, you know, you're a urogynecologist, you have such years and years of working with women and that there is really no magic pill when it comes to our sex life and our libido and our pelvic floor health. So I'd love to just kind of dive in a little more around that. And before we start, I would love if you could share a little bit about kind of your journey and what led you to this work. Well, it's funny because I didn't go into medical school saying that I wanted to be looking at vaginas all day long. So I was always interested in medicine going way, way back. It's a funny story. Like when I was four years old, there was a TV show called Emergency. And it was about this paramedic and uh, firefighters in California. And as a four-year-old, I was obsessed with this TV show. And uh, I joke around because I go, nowadays, I don't think I would have even let my four-year-old watch this. It was pretty, you know, graphic in some ways, but it was all about emergencies and caring for people. And and around the same time, my mom was Mm -hmm. pregnant. And I remember she had a book on pregnancy and delivery. And I was obsessed with that book too. And I'm like looking through all the pictures of the pregnant uterus and, you know, how is a baby going to come out? So I think that all kind of added into why I became interested in, in medicine. And so when I entered medical school right outside of college, I didn't know exactly what area of medicine I wanted to go into. I was thinking pediatrics because I really liked the kids. I just quickly learned I didn't like pediatrics. And then I found myself being drawn to the surgical professions. And I actually started my career in general surgery. That's where I started my residency. But I found with general surgery, surgery, I didn't have that personal relationship with the patients that I was looking for. I was the resident that was going around trying to talk to people about how did they feel now that they no longer had their, mm-hmm. their gallbladder or their appendix. So that kind of brought me back around to gynecology where I can do the surgery and then also develop that relationship with the patients. Mm-hmm. But um, I have an actual funny story. I have a friend who was a podiatrist. And at the time, we were both going through residency. And one day over lunch, I said to her, I was like, ew, how do you look at people's nasty feet all day long? <laughs> and she looked, just looked up from her lunch and she's like, are, are you serious? And I was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I forgot what I do. So I think in <laughs> medical school, you become desensitized to things, you know? Right. And, and my, my kids joke that mommy's a vagina doctor. And, you, you know, I say there's, you got to have doctors for all different parts. So I don't look at it like that. And you just become you know, it's just another body part. So, and then I really, even though as much as I love delivering babies, I I like to sleep at night. (laughs) So dealing with the the sleep deprivation of being an an obstetrician was not going to be in my world. And I found urogynecology at the very end of my training. And so I got lucky enough to get into a fellowship in time and then here I am. So that's how I got involved with it. So- And I, and I do, I love your passion for the patient care because I see that, you know, as your career has evolved, you know, it's really something you're so passionate about. It's helping women develop this, you know, holistic relationship to their bodies, not just their vaginas, but, you know, and that's a big part of it. And so I'm curious, you know, in all the years of all the women that you worked with, what are some of the main concerns you feel like women struggle with? 
You know, I think that, and what we'll talk about later today is sexuality, because even in the OBGYN world, it's kind of not really mentioned. It's kind of, you know, we get trained in it, but not, not enough training. And it's, you know, there's this big rush in medicine now, see more patients, spend less time. So dealing with sexual issues becomes kind of like an afterthought. You know, a lot of times doctors don't bring it up because they just don't have the time to dive into that. Some doctors even kind of cross their fingers and hope that the patients won't bring it up because they just don't have the training to to get into it. So I think that tends to be one of the most common concerns that just gets ignored, just gets completely ignored. The other thing I see a lot is from all different I guess stages of life when when women are younger, it's issues around their period and under uh, around fertility, and then as women get older, it becomes more. There's more worry of, of developing cancers and recurrent infections become very common. So it's a whole range of in different um, life stages what, what becomes the issues around our genital parts and around our pelvic health. Yeah, and I know for. For me and my kind of demographic of age, there's all the, you know, as we age, we have all kinds of different concerns come up, like you say, and like dealing with those transitions um, without fear is, I think, a challenge for many women. And I think it's tough because, you know, we get so much education in the school system about your periods and everyone is like, you pretty much knows about your menstrual cycle. But nobody ever talks about the perimenopause or menopausal changes. Uh, time and time again, I have patients come in and I start to explain to them, you know, your hormones are going to start changing, your cycles are going to get um, a little bit off, they may not come as frequently, they may be longer, they may be shorter, the bleeding is going to change, you know, there's going to be a lot of changes in mood and sleep and weight gain and, and so many different changes in the body, nobody talks about that later transition. And so many women come in and they say, well, wait a minute, why, why haven't I ever heard about this stuff before? And I think one of the things that we're starting to see is that conversation around menopause is becoming more common, but even then it's, it's lacking. Yeah, I can agree with you there. But I think, you know, the more we are educated and the more we know what to expect, the more we can kind of prepare and realize it doesn't have to be kind of that death sentence so many women think you know there's the stories out there like oh once you hit menopause you know your sexual life is over and you're just going to dry up and and I believe that's not true at all so I'd love if you would maybe speak to that for a moment so you know one of the things that does happen especially when we talk about the drying up is as you go through menopause and even that perimenopausal period you know I'll back up for a minute. People always come in and they want, they want to be tested. Am I in menopause? Well, there's no traditional medical test that say, let's do your blood work and poof, okay, you're in menopause. It's more of kind of following the levels, following the symptoms. And me- that perimenopausal period can start as early as 36 years old and or it can start much later. I've had, I actually, we had a woman in my fellowship, she was kind of like this anomaly. She was in her eighties and was still getting her period. Wow. And which was, which was pretty amazing, but they couldn't find anything, you know, wrong with her. It just happened to be the way she gen- genetically was, which is kind of scary to think about being 80 years old and, and getting pregnant and having to chase after a, you know, a toddler. But that, so that perimenopausal period can be months to years. So that transition, you know, people think like, okay, the periods are are kind of getting spacing out. Like, all right, I'll be done in a year. No, everybody's different. And there's no way to predict when you'll be done. So where it gets a little bit more difficult is the definition of menopause is going a whole year without a period. So I've had women that are go like, 10, 11 months, and they'll be like, oh, I must be in menopause. And then all of a sudden, boom, they get their period. And I'm like, nope, you got to start the, start the cycle again. When you go a whole full year, then you're in menopause. But then the problem then becomes is things like uterine cancer can increase as we get older. And one of the number one signs that, that this can be a problem is vaginal bleeding. 
So a lot of women mistake this vaginal bleeding as their period, and it can it can happen cyclically, and or you know or you're in that perimenopausal time and it's kind of there's no rhyme or reason to when the periods are coming it's very easy to mistake this vaginal bleeding as a period when it could be something more serious so it's something that's important to be going to your doctor for for yearly checkups on this because you don't want to ignore something that could be easily taken care of and most uterine cancers when they're found early majority of them are really easy to take care of it's just finding them early so um I kind of went on a tangent there. <laughs> well, no, but I, but I think I want to come back to this in a minute of like what oh, women the, can do to kind of remain, you know, vital as they go through menopause and everything like that. But I know how, you know, we were talking the other day and you, you mentioned that there is no magic pill. And I think yes. that's powerful because I think women, we all, everybody wants the easy button and sometimes that's just not the case. So yeah, could you share a little bit more about that if you would? You know, I think it really, the idea of this magic pill kind of came to light when Vi Viagra came on the market. And so Viagra is a medication that men use for erectile dysfunction. It's really interesting because I found a medical ethics article on how medical conditions get marketed years before the release of a medication. And in this article, they were talking, it made a really interesting point was that how Viagra, they talked about how marketing of conditions is started years before a medication comes out. That under the FDA, it's illegal to market a medication before it's approved, but you can start marketing the condition. So mm. a condition we know as impotence got rebranded and marketed as erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely some issues with underlying pharmaceutical business bring awareness but also they're doing it for a marketing purpose so erectile dysfunction as a condition and brought light now bringing light is a good thing but also we got to balance it with the marketing women started saying well if men have a pill we want a pill and it's interesting because right around the same time pharmaceutical companies started to develop medications to treat women's low libido. Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, it went from low libido to there was actual name for the condition, which is hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And what's interesting about that is, like we said, you're bringing a condition to light, but you're, you're doing it in a marketing way. And unfortunately, I find in the United States, we all tend to be kind of grab onto labels. Yeah. And it's not to say that women don't suffer from problems with low desire and low, low libido, but you have to really be careful because, you know, are we better for women or are we bringing it to light to sell more drugs? Mm -hmm. So that becomes an issue. Yeah. So you can take the good and the bad. So right before these medications that were, trying, were in the pipeline for women's sexual desire disorder, they saw a drastic rise in continuing medical education programs for doctors on this condition and bringing you know, more attention to it. So it was really interesting how it happened. But the problem with women's sexuality and the problem with Viagra is women are like, well, I want a Viagra. Well, you have to understand how Viagra works. Viagra, the little blue pill, or the other medications that came out on the market after that, there's a whole list of them, um, but everybody thinks of Viagra because that was the first and they really did a great job marketing, was that it doesn't make you horny. And that's what people are looking for. They're looking for something that's going to make them horny. Mm -hmm. And what happens with Viagra is you take the pill. If a man becomes sexually excited, there's a process that happens after brain excitement that then triggers increased blood flow to the penis. And that's all that Viagra does is it 
aids in increasing the blood flow to the genitals. So it's not a magic pill because if a, if a man takes that pill and they're not in the mood, nothing's going to happen. So that was one of the first studies. They actually tried to do studies with women with Viagra. And, but they were looking at it from the wrong standpoint. I still think that Viagra could help with women and I have prescribed it for women. They were looking at, did it increase mood? Well, no, it didn't increase mood, but what Viagra can do for women is it can increase blood flow to the genitals once someone was mentally in the mood, which can increase sensitivity and can increase lubrication. So those things actually decrease when we go through menopause because you get decreased blood flow to the genitals, which then causes decreasing of the tissue. The tissue becomes very thin and becomes dry and can crack very easily. So sex becomes more uncomfortable as you go through menopause. So, but, you know, these general are not without side effects. I mean, Viagra, you can get terrible headaches. You can see halos around lights, blue halos if you take too much. Stuffiness of the nose. So it's not very sexy when you're like, okay, I'm getting increased blood flow, but I'm, you know, sniffling all the time. So that does, you know, so a lot of nasal congestion because the same kind of tissue that gets engorged during sex is actually you have an engorgement yeah. of the, the nasal passages, that mucosa. So, so then there was a drug that is called flib flibacerin is the medical name of the drug, which is now what is on the market, the Addy. So flibacerin was actually originally an antidepressant that failed getting through the FDA for as an antidepressant. So then they found that maybe one of the side effects was that it maybe it put women in the mood. So the initial pharmaceutical company that owned that medication tried to get it on the market for low libido. And unfortunately, their studies failed miser miserably, meaning that it only showed an increase in what's called satisfying sexual encounters of 0 0.5 episodes a month. So there wasn't that much over placebo. So they, they failed. They tried again to get it on the market and it failed. Um, so then what happened was there was this grassroots movement by a company called Sprout. And they started, Sprout bought this medication from the original pharmaceutical company. And so they started this grassroots movement. They got a lot of women's groups involved. They had these women's groups kind of petition and send letters to the government and the FDA and senators saying, you know, you guys are all being sexist because you're not approving this medication. Well, next thing you know, I honestly think that the FDA got bullied into approving it because there was nothing that changed in the studies. There was nothing that like that got changed with the medication. And so a medication that had been refused multiple times by the FDA all of a sudden gets approved. And it gets approved and then Sprout turned around and sold that, sold their medication for like $1 billion to another pharmaceutical company that took it over. But yes, can med med like traditional medicine and pharmaceuticals be sexist? Yes, because most most drugs are tested on men and not women. But in this case, I'm not exactly sure fighting to get that drug on the market was the best thing because here's a drug that has a lot of side effects. You have to take it every single day. You can only get it from a doctor who's been specially trained in how to prescribe it. And the side effects can include lightheadedness, dizziness, fainting, seizure. You know, you can't drink alcohol while you're on it because that increases your risk of seizure. You know, it has to be taken every single day to work, to, to be able to work. And it only increased the number of satisfying sexual events by 0 0.5 a month. So I say, why, why waste your money on a pill when there's so many other ways that you can improve your, your, your sex life and your libido and your desire 
without wasting the money on the pill, waste, going through all those those side effects. Plus, the way it works is that it affects your serotonin levels, and it's you know the, the human se- female sexuality. There's so many hormones that that go on. Um, from estrogen to testosterone to serotonin to um, melatonin. And there's so many different processes that I think the biggest problem is that we're just a little bit too complex for a pill to exist. Um, Or at least I don't think we're at the point where we're, we're any closer to finding that magic pill. There was a new product that came out on the market just this are called uh, Vilesi is the brand name. Um, I'm not going to even try to butcher the the pharmaceutical name, but that one's an injection. That one had a little bit better science behind it, and the nice thing about that medication is you only use it when when's needed. But it's an injection, so you have to inject this into your stomach. Um, and it comes with like a little auto injector. It's got like, it looks like a pen and you press a button and it injects it for you. And you have to inject it 45 minutes prior to any kind of sexual activity. And it's also working with kind of the similar, I mean, different hormones, but the same pathway. It's working with more with the melatonin and, and um, affecting dopamine. And so you've got a lot of different chemicals that are involved in sexuality. They were able to show in their studies that it improved sex- satisfying sexual episodes 1.2 percent. You know, you get these off numbers because you know you're looking at statistics. You know, I don't know, like with the other drug, I don't know how you get half of us, you know, satisfying sexual event. But you know, the newer drug is has a little bit higher numbers. Mm-hmm. But even then, I, I think the problem is women because we're so complex that it's even harder to design an effective study to see if these things work because there's so many factors that go into putting us in the mood. Right. Um, Well, I think it's interesting. And I just want to point this because we were talking about this the other day, you know, on the the power of of placebo or even just noticing like if you give yourself 45 minutes to prepare for a sexual event, you're going to be more likely to enjoy it anyway, right? You're mentally preparing, you're getting yourself in the context of opening up to that. So I think, and we were talking the other day, you were mentioning about that one um, there, there was a product, and I have, to, I keep forgetting. I forgot to look to see if it's still on the market. It was called Zestra, and it was this blend of essential oils that you, you would rub on your clitoris. And I remember, you know, this was supposed to increase people's mood, and it, and it was great because the instructions were like for 10, 15 minutes, whatever, or a half an hour. I can't remember what the what the number was, but you had to rub this this like oil into your clitoris. And that was supposed to increase your, your mood. Well, I was like, well, if someone is purposely trying to do something and you're rubbing the clitoris and you're anticipating to try to have sex, eventually something would get stirring. So, so yeah, I thought that was, it was interesting that they got it through. I kind of was wondering if we did a study and we just like used baby oil versus this product, if we'd get the same, you know, same kind of results. So, well, well, you know, so I think what I am understanding from this conversation and what you, you know, it's important to realize that we are very complex and, you know, the medicine, it would be lovely to say, oh, I've got this issue. People love to, like you said, people love to connect to labels. They want to diagnose themselves so then they can find the cure, but really it's not so simple. So I'd love if you would share, what are some things that women can do to, you know, kind of increase this libido, kind of keep their sexuality vital as they age and just that, you know, that don't require the medication that has a very small percentage of of helping out anyway. I think one of the things is just to, you know, accept yourself. Mm -hmm. Your program with the Finding Your Feminine Fire is just immense. I mean, you need to kind of reconnect with yourself and find yourself and work with that and figure out 
what kind of things turn you on? I tell my patients all the time that your brain is your largest sex organ. So you can do anything anywhere else, but if your brain is just not there, nothing's going to work. We also need to get rid of this idea that it's going to be like the movies or like when, it, when we were 18, where you're sitting there one minute, next minute, you're all fired up and ready to go. Because our responsibilities increase and as our responsibilities increase women start multitasking and the problem mm -hmm. is a lot of us don't put ourselves first and so sex gets put on the back burner and then it's difficult to get in the mood if you know say if you're a mother and you're laying there and you're like you can't multitask and have sex because you can't be laying there going all right, the laundry has to be done. This is what's going to be for dinner tonight. And like little Johnny has to be picked up from baseball. And, you know, that's not going to happen. That's the one thing that men definitely have over us is that they're able to focus on one task. We multitask and sex is not the place to multitask. Uh, the other thing is to look at a lot of the sex research is antiquated because you think of Masters and Johnson who are, you know, did great research and they have their, a lot of people have seen their traditional curve of, you know, there's, you know, initiation, desire, you know, orgasm or plateau and orgasm. So that, that nice graph of sexuality doesn't really apply to women. Mm -hmm. um, I love Rosemary Bassan, and I hope to get her on my podcast at some point in the future, but she does a lot of research on female sexuality, and even her model of female sexuality has changed over the years. It started off as one circle. Now it's like circles within circles, but I, I'd like to show patients because a lot of us think we have to have the desire to have sex, that if you don't have the desire, then don't have sex. Well, Rosemary's model shows that sometimes just going through the steps and going through the motions will create the desire, which then will lead to lubrication and arousal and, you know, and then orgasm. So when I bring this up amongst my patients, they go, huh. And I found that kind of worked for myself because I, you know, I was the person that was also putting things off and be like, I got to get this stuff done. You know, I'm too busy and it's just stopping and, you know, I'm not in the mood. Well, go through the steps, see what happens and, you know, make some limitations with your partner. Like, all right, listen, let's, cause you don't want that pressure of like, okay, if we go through the steps, then I'm going to have to do it. And I don't really know if I'm in the mood cause that's going to put a mental block on things. Mm -hmm. You know, if in people with, with painful sex issues, they tend to clench when any time sex is brought up. So they, they, the anticipation of sex creates clenching, which then creates pain when they have any kind of intercourse, which then causes this psychological, like, oh, pay, sex hurts. So now mm -hmm. I'm going to avoid it. And it becomes this vicious circle. So yeah. I think, you know, working with your partner and being like, okay, well, let's just kind of, you know, see, like, let's give it like 15 minutes, you know, let's give it a half an hour. If you want to put a time on it or just say like, oh, let's, let's just, let's kind of like, just kind of be with each other and touch and, and see if it goes anywhere. If it does, great. But if it doesn't, let's kind of have an agreement to, to stop it so that there's yeah. not that pressure. And once my patients started doing this, they were reporting like, oh my God, you know, sex was good. You know, and sometimes you can even ask a patient, you know, they come in like, oh, I have a sexual disorder. I need to be treated. And you go, well, you know, and there are sexual disorders that need to be treated, but I'm saying like, I think a majority of people, you go, well, when you actually have sex, do you enjoy it? And they're like, well, yeah, once I get in the mood, well, that's the thing. You need to try to figure out the things that are going to get you in the mood. And I, unfortunately, I don't think it's a magic pill. So, I mean, could these pills and, and things be tools? Yes. Mm -hmm. And like we said, placebo, um, you know, not from a sexual standpoint but there's um, we talked the other day when on my podcast when we we're talking about Robbie Richman created mm -hmm. this program that his pill it's called the X pill it's a placebo he admits it's a placebo it is like brown rice 
but the idea is you put your intention of what you want in life or what you want to happen on that pill. And if you believe in that pill and you ingest it, guess what? It's going to work. So that's the case with these things. If you really go, all right, this is going to work, you take it, it's going to work. But you could do that with anything, you know, so you could find other products. As long as you believe in it, it's going to work. But I, I say take that energy of believing in something outside of you and put that energy back on you and find that inside of you and, and find that belief inside of you to trigger that, that desire. I so. love that. I think that's <laughs> powerful. Yeah. And is there any, any other tips that you could share? Then we get into with increasing blood flow to the pelvis. What happens, especially in menopause, is our blood vessels start to shrink up. And also, like I said, the vaginal tissue gets, gets thinner, it get, gets more, it can crack, it can rip and tear. But it's one of those things where, I know this sounds all terrible, but it's one of those things if you don't use it, you lose it. And it's so true when it comes to dealing with the vagina. So think of sex and not just for your your mental health and your, your relationship health, but also for your physical health, because the more, it's like exercising. I mean, people, you know, exercise like crazy, you know, they'll, I have friends that won't give up going to the gym, but they'll give up, you know, having sex with their partner. So, you know, think of it as this is, you know, something you need to keep that tissue healthy. The more aroused you are, the more blood flow you kind of, that you can, keep in that area, keep those blood vessels healthy. But there are some supplements that can help too. L-arginine. So let's go back to the Viagra for a minute. So Viagra increases blood flow to the pelvis and that's how it works in men and that's how it can work in women. You can get supplements that do the same thing. L-arginine is an amino acid and one of its side effects is it increases blood flow. It's used in cardiovascular disease in lower doses, but you can actually use a Viagra type dose and have the same reaction. So usually, I mean, you got to make sure you have medical conditions that it's safe to use. And I recommend that if patients are thinking about trying L-arginine, that you check with your doctor to make mm -hmm. sure that it's okay because you can still have the same side effects as Viagra. But L-arginine is usually about, you can take it as a daily dose to in, just increase blood vessels, blood flow and, and have healthy blood vessels. And it usually is anywhere from 500 milligrams to uh, 1.5 grams, but you can also take it as needed with sexual activity, like a Viagra, and, and that's much cheaper than trying to buy Viagra, because I think Viagra, I think we're up to about $30 or more a pill if you try to pay cash for it. it it's gotten quite expensive, where L-arginine you can find in any kind of health food store, and usually the Viagra dosing is about five grams before sexual activity. Um, now, it's interesting to know not only you want to make sure that you have are healthy enough to take something like that and you want to check with your doctor but if you have a history of herpes whether that be oral herpes or um, general herpes one of the problems with l-arginine is by increasing the blood flow to these areas you can activate virus so sometimes you have to balance it out with an equal amount of leucine which is, uh, I'm sorry, lysine, lysine, L-Y-S-I-N-E. So mm -hmm. you want to balance it out because that actually helps to prevent activation of the virus. You know, there are so many different things, perimenopausal, postmenopausal, there are different hormone products on the market to kind of keep that vaginal tissue nice and thick and healthy because it, it will thin out. Uh, some people do get nervous about the hormones, but the, the creams and the um, suppositories that are available by prescription are typically considered not absorbed systemically. They don't go through your whole system. So once again, you want to check with your doctor. There are some bioidentical um, estrogens that are on the market for use in the vagina. Um, there's also DHEA. DHEA is a precursor hormone to estrogen and testosterone. Um, it can be taken orally to boost libido. But the problem is the pill forms don't get absorbed that well in your system. So you're better off with a, 
one that can be sprayed under the tongue or like a tincture that can be put under the tongue. DHEA is sold over the counter. I still recommend that patients go over with their doctors if, if it's safe for them to be taking that. There is a prescription DHEA suppository that women can use in the vagina. There's also a good friend of ours makes a cream called Jolva that has DHEA and that can increase the, improve the tissue in the vagina. Mm -hmm. um, and then we get all the way up to the lasers and, and the kind of cosmetic type of procedures that are out there. There's the Mona Lisa Touch is the one laser. Uh, well, actually, they've come out, that was the initial laser that came out on the market back in, it was approved in the United States, I think, I believe in 2016 for use. It's been used in Europe for years, but basically using light energy to penetrate the tissue and cause a microscopic uh, injuries to the tissue stimulates the body to heal itself. And in stimulating the body to heal itself, it will actually repair the vaginal tissue and return it back to a younger state. So somebody was brilliant in that they took laser therapies and light energy therapies that have been used since the 80s for cosmetic reasons for face and other areas of skin, and they just turned it into a vaginal probe. Mm -hmm. So and there's a couple other lasers that have come out on the market. And then there was a, there's other things called radio frequency, which uses the same idea, but instead of using light, it uses sound waves to penetrate the tissue and generate heat. And they found that when you heat tissue to a certain temperature, it will cause collagen and elastin to rehook up. And so we'll regenerate that tissue and make it more elastic again. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of and I, and I say cosmetic, meaning that right now, majority of insurance companies do not pay for it, even though there have been number of studies showing that these treatments can help treat a condition, which is called atrophic vaginitis, which is that thinning of the tissue that happens in menopause. Um, usually I find that with any new technology, insurance companies usually lag about 10 years behind with their coverage. So right mm -hmm. now, nobody seems to be covering it, but um, it's not cosmetic in that it's not needed and it's not frivolous. It's really treating the vagina and getting it back to the way um, it was right. when you were younger. So. Well, and I think too, you know, we spend so much time, we don't always think about the vagina and the vulva, but we also need, you know, like you would put lotion on your face, you know, it's important to yes. take care of your whole body, you know, and we tend to just kind of leave that area out of the equation, most women, because of shame or whatever our conditioning is, or just not feeling comfortable or just not knowing what to do. So I think even like you mentioned, if there's something that you, you got to use it or you lose it. So even if you don't have a partner, you can, you know, have those intimate experiences with yourself. And, you know, yes. even just that daily massage of your vulva can be so healthy for the tissue. Yes. I, so I just wanted to point that too, because I think that's something that we just neglect to think about. You know, because it, the vagina will actually shrink up without use. And so I've had a number of patients and it's, it's not that you can't get it back. It just, the longer it goes, the more difficult it can be. And mm -hmm. I've had a couple number of patients who may have been, you know, by themselves or may have been divorced or may have been in a relationship where, you know, the husbands have erectile dysfunction. And now, you know, it, over time that opening will shrink up so that trying to even touch the tissue become very painful. If, right. if that patient's in, interested in penetrative sex, trying to get even a finger inside can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. So starting young and trying to keep that tissue healthy is a lot easier than trying to reverse it after it's gone through those 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 changes but you can reverse it and there's pelvic physical therapy and people always look at me like I'm crazy when I bring up pelvic physical therapy but if you had an injury or condition anywhere else in your body you go to a physical therapist mm -hmm. there is a whole slew of these physical therapists around the country that they're sole purpose is to treat your pelvis. So they are trained in how to massage the tissue, how to stretch the tissue to try to get it back to where it was before. So mm -hmm. they're I invaluable. <laughs> I do. I always say, you know, you, you need to always have a good pelvic floor PT because, you know, even you might not realize like certain things that, like back pain and things like that can be remedied. You would be amazed at what you can, you know, like you, like you said, we need to take care of our holistic, our whole entire body. So the pelvic floor is an, 
important part of that, especially as a woman, you know, whether you've had kids or not, you know, as we age, it's so important to keep that, that area healthy and toned. And I think, you know, it's important that a, there's a good number of women who are just, you know, whether it's embarrassment or just lack of knowledge, they don't even know what they look like down there. Mm-hmm. And I say down there <laughs> just because I, I put that in quotes because my, when I went in training, I had a doctor that was like, never refer to a woman as parts as down there. <laughs> but it's true. And I try to encourage patients to take a mirror and look because there can be simple changes that are happening that could be something that you could overlook. I and mean, you can get skin cancer in that area. Mm-hmm. I've had patients with melanoma down there and you know if you're not looking then you you don't know and you need to know what's normal so that when something else happens you know it's not normal so I have two young daughters I encourage them to take you know ever since they were young take a mirror and check you know you got to check your body everywhere so you know if you have a good dermatologist good dermatologists will look at your skin everywhere and sometimes it's hard to find that because um you know I think a lot of the medical professions, if if they're not a gynecologist, they go, oh, that's not my part. But guess what? There's skin down there. You know, it needs to be looked at. (laughs) So you look at it. Your doctor should look at it. (laughs) Yes. Well, these are, I mean, thank you so much for sharing all this wisdom. And I'm curious, you know, I'd love if you could share where people can find out more about you. And I know you have a new website with some helpful tools for the pelvic floor. If you could share more about that. Sure. Well, I'm just about done with my personal website, which is drbetsygreenleaf.com. So it's D-R and then B-E-T-S-Y, Greenleaf, G-R-E-E-N-L-E-A-F.com. So that'll have a lot of links to these other websites. But I also have the pelvic floor store. So what I was finding with patients um, was that I'd recommend products to them to help them, whether it was for, for recurrent urinary tract infections, recurrent vaginal infections, healthy lubricants. Healthy lubricants is a whole nother, whole nother. Actually, let me mention it about lubricants. Yes, please everybody thinks KY jelly. If you're using KY jelly, stop. Stop right now. KY jelly was invented to purposely dry your tissue out. So one of the side effects of it is it's a lubricant, but it dries your tissue out. So you need more and more and more. Mm -hmm. So great marketing for them. You know, you, you use it and you need to buy more. But they kind of cornered the market of what people think of initially when they think of lubricants. The science of lubricants has gotten so incredible in the last couple of years where we're looking at not just pH of the, so we're not just looking at the acidity level of the lubricant, but actual how rough is it on the tissue. And there are lubricants out there that can actually cause microscopic scratches in the tissue, which then increase your risk of irritation and infection. So there's you know, definitely, there's a whole science behind healthy lubricants. So the lubricants on the pelvic floor store. And like I said, I, I needed a place where patients could find everything in one place because some of these products, pelvic health products, refuse to sell on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of politics behind why that is. So I needed to find a place where I could put everything that I recommended to patients all mm-hmm. one place. So that's pelvicfloorstore.com. So you can find things on there. Beautiful. And I'm always trying to add little articles or find new products to put on there. So yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much again for sharing all your wisdom and for being here today. It's been such a pleasure having you. And I'm curious if there's any, you know, last words you'd like to share, or if there's maybe a question that you wish that I would have asked that I didn't ask. Oh, that's a, that's a good question. I like that one. I just think that the main thing is that you have the power in yourself. You have the power to heal. You have the power to solve your problems. You know, I like to kind of like Dorothy syndrome. You know, you're looking for your answers out there in a magic pill and a magic lotion, a potion. It's not there. You know, put those ruby slippers on. It's in you. You got it. So I think that's the main, I think that's the main message I want people to know that they can solve their problems. And, you know, I'm not putting aside that sexual disorders are not real. I'm just saying that 
you need to look in yourself and find the answer because it's there. I love that. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Betsy. And for everyone that's listening, I'll make sure to put all the ways you can connect with her in the show notes. And thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you next week. Thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Feminine Fire podcast. This is your host, Amanda Testa. And if you have felt a calling while listening to this podcast to take this work to a deeper level, this is your golden invitation. I invite you to reach out. You can contact me at amandatesta.com slash activate. And we can have a heart to heart to discuss more about how this work can transform your life. You can also join us on Facebook and the group Find Your Feminine Fire group. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please share with your friends. Go to iTunes and give me a five-star rating and a raving review so I can connect with other amazing listeners like yourself. Thank you so much for being a part of the community.